Hey, uh, let's start again. Um, so the, the idea of combining two stimuli and sort of associate those two stimuli in order to uh, change the activity of a specific synapse. Uh, and incidentally, I, I, I think I managed to uh, put it in the wrong order just a moment ago, uh, putting the conditioning stimulus after the unconditioned. Uh, it should be the conditioning stimulus before the unconditioned, so that you have calcium in the cell before you actually activate the uh, 5-HT receptor and activate the cyclic AMP. Uh, so, conditioning before unconditioned. Uh, this also goes way back in many ways. Uh, this uh, postulate uh, from Donald Hepp uh, is basically from a book he wrote in 1949, uh, to a very large extent based on completely uh, theoretical consideration of how learning could be organized in the, in the nervous system and trying to think of a neurobiological basis for, for learning, coming up with the idea that basically if you have two inputs to a nerve cell, it could be the association of those two different inputs which could be learned, uh, that you learn that this goes with that uh, and therefore uh, you could have what has now been called a Hebbian synapse, a synapse which is modulated by uh, the concurrent activity in two different uh, inputs. And this is essentially also what was uh, seen in the aplysia. So in this case, just showing that uh, if you have sort of uh, two different inputs, uh, one of them which doesn't really uh, correlate with the output pattern in this uh, neuron going by 3, 2, 1 here. If you have an input pattern which corresponds nicely with this, that uh, input pattern will be strengthened. Uh, so Basically, what Hip was saying, put in a slightly popular way, was what fires together, wires together, uh, which has now become a very uh, well-known postulate, and which is fairly true. Uh, so if you have kind of uh, two sets of inputs which fire together, you will have these connections strengthened uh, efficiently. Uh, so that also goes for uh, the work that has been done on long-term potentiation, LTP, uh, which uh, has really become a basis for a lot of the uh, investigations into the molecular mechanisms of uh, learning and memory uh, in vertebrates. Uh, so mainly because of the interest coming from uh, the HM uh, story that we spoke about last time uh, and Uh, consequent work on the hippocampus and uh, the idea that hippocampus is involved in establishing memory and also as I mentioned last time the possibility of studying this very simple circuitry in, in the hippocampus and uh, looking into how the different synapses are being uh, changed by uh, different uh, inputs. So this was uh, originally uh, described by Terje Lemo uh, in Oslo uh, in the 1960s. In many ways, uh, completely coincidence. Uh, he, as many others at that time, uh, he started making slices of the rabbit hippocampus in, in, in this case and just playing around it, with it. And, and the interest was mainly just to try and find out what the hell is this Uh, part of the cortex which was removed in uh, HM doing. Uh, so he was playing around with it and, and being uh, Scandinavian, he was, he was of course slightly methodological, so he was basically trying all sorts of different uh, inputs, uh, different stimulus intensities, different frequencies, etc., and then testing uh, the activity of uh, the different connections uh, in various ways. So in this case, uh, he was simply uh, looking at uh, the synaptic efficiency, so uh, stimulating uh, one neuron and then recording the response in another neuron uh, in the hippocampus. Uh, if he did that in the control situation here, he didn't get much of a response. Now if he then gave a tetanus stimulation, meaning uh, a stimulus of uh, 20 hertz for 15 seconds, uh, 
Uh, so instead of just giving a stimulus every now and then, he really gave high frequency stimulation, 20 hertz, and did it for a 15 uh, second period. Uh, to begin with, he saw a much larger response in uh, the neuron that he measured from, but which disappeared again here after uh, a couple of uh, minutes. Then he did it again, tetanus, 20, second, 20 hertz for 15 seconds, and this time he saw a much, much uh, longer lasting response, also much, much bigger, uh, outlasting the period before he gave another uh, 20 hertz stimulus for 15 seconds, larger response, long lasting, again, longer, stronger response, very long lasting, and then again. And he saw that this continued for, as you can see, six hours. So a much, much larger response. It's five times uh, the original, even seven times the original response down here, and it could last for a very, very long time. So the question is, of course, what is the reason for this was what is causing it, and this is uh, what has been the topic of quite a lot of research uh, since then. Um, this is just to show that uh, there is a high degree of uh, specificity in this. Uh, if you stimulate uh, different uh, input neurons, one you stimulate with high frequency, so 20 hertz, 15 seconds, the other one you stimulate with low frequency. Then if you test this pathway, pathway one, you get a large response. If you test the other pathway, you get the same low response as in the control situation. So it's specific for this synapse. It's not seen for this synapse. So it has nothing as such to do with the response in general of this recording neuron, uh, this pyramidal cell neuron in CA1, uh, it has to do with that exactly, that exact uh, synaptic connection between this CA3 neuron and this CA1 neuron. It doesn't affect other synapses in the same uh, uh, neuron. Uh, so what is then interesting is that uh, the degree of prior uh, depolarization determines how big uh, the response is. Uh, so if you change the depolarization before you actually induce the, uh, the high frequency stimulation, you can actually uh, increase or decrease the level of uh, this um, um, uh, long-term potentiation. So essentially it turns out that the long-term potentiation effect depends on the amount of depolarization that you can make of the uh, postsynaptic cell. So in this case the amount of prior depolarization that you make of the CA1 pyramidal cell here. So what you do when you give 20 hertz uh, is that you depolarize first, then you depolarize again, then you depolarize again, basically 20 times within a second. And it turns out that it is this accumulating depolarization which turns on the long-term potentiation. So it's necessary to have that depolarization in order for it uh, to occur. Uh, well, I just said that, so I'm not going to...